welcome. Whew. It's very loud. Sorry about that little AV issue. So if you could have a seat, make yourself comfortable. Thank you. So welcome, my name is Pontier Sacri. I work here at the museum and we are in the business of engaging you to talk about your relationship with nature, how you fit into your environment, how you relate to what is around you in here in Jackson Hole and wherever you travel, wherever you're from. So that's why I'm very excited this evening to host the third night of the SHIFT inaugural event called Me, Jackson Hole, and Nature. So in a moment, Christian Beckwith, our event director, will talk more about the whole oeuvre, the whole arc of the event. But tonight, what we're looking at are 10 particular personal interpretations of people and how they react and how they live in the splendor that we have around us, all the different ways that they intersect. There were a number of films that were submitted, all in this 20 by 20 style, which is Japanese, 20 slides, 20 seconds of narrative each. So they're all a little bit over six minutes. And the Japanese term for it is pacha kucha. We call it 20 by 20. And so these 10 were selected because of their unique view on experiencing nature in Jackson Hole. So again, welcome to the museum. We're thrilled that you're here this evening. And without further ado, I will also say that I am chair of the Travel and Tourism Board, which is also known as the Lodging Tax Board, and it has funded the SHIFT event. This is our beta event, if you will. We're testing out this conservation conversation. This idea was brought to us by Ed Riddell from Blend Creative two years ago when we were talking to advertising firms about how we could build and shore up tourism in October. For those people who work in the tourism field, October is sort of when we fall off a shelf of visitation. So we wanted to introduce a festival that was germane to who we are, not contrived, if you will. And so the conservation conversation is who we are. It is why we live here and it's honoring our pioneers and also trying to build an understanding of how we can move forward in the world in a conservation themed way. And that is what SHIFT is about. So again, on two reasons, I'm honored to have you here this evening. So now I will pass this on to Christian Beckwith. Thank you. Thank you, Bontier. So that woman has carried the flag for this festival for the last six months, like nobody else in this valley, and we owe her a debt of gratitude. I'm here, thank you. My name is Christian Beckwith. I'm honored to be SHIFT's director and honored to see so many of you again here tonight for the third night of the first year of the SHIFT Festival. On Friday night at the Center for the Arts, we began this exploration of what SHIFT could and should become at the Center for the Arts as we looked at Jackson Hole, this high altitude ecosystem, and the idea of food. How does a place with such severe weather, such a short growing season, create a food system that's sustainable? Night two was last night, Pink Garter Theater. With last night's conversation, we had a glimpse into the future of what the climbers and skiers and paddlers and paragliders of this valley might do to step into the legacy of conservation, the tradition that extends all the way back to John Muir and then carries forward to David Brower, Yvonne Chouinard, Jeremy Jones. What does it look like for those of us who love adventure so much as stewards of the places that we love to play? Tonight is one of the most important nights because tonight we explore one of the fundamental elements of Schiff's mission statement. SHIFT inspires communities like ours to preserve the natural capital that's essential to our economic success. But in order to figure out what it is we're preserving, we need your feedback. We have our experiences, they're limited to a few people, so we open this conversation up to our community, those best positioned to define exactly what it is we value most about Jackson Hole and what we are trying to preserve for future generations. So, with no further ado, Pachakucha, Shift 2020, 
and DJ Rocky Vertone is going to kick it off. Thank you. Hi. So our first presentation is Ed Levino, and it's titled The Figure in the Landscape. I've been photographing ever since I was a child. I can't remember a time when photography was not an important part of my life. I use a large format camera to photograph landscapes, still life arrangements, and people. When I moved to Wyoming about 20 years ago, I became interested Where's in the photographing audio for the expansive that? landscape of this the greater one? Yellowstone ecosystem. I take a camera just about everywhere I go, including on extended trips into the Green River Mountain Range, Yellowstone, weird. and the Tetons. It was just too tiny. About 10 years through. ago, I started integrating the human figure into my high plains landscapes. This figurative work is what I've been working on most recently. The variables are challenging, but I love the possibilities it presents for communicating ideas and telling stories. My goal with these environmental portraits is to integrate the figure seamlessly into undisturbed natural settings. I strive to portray the human form in a way that is truthful and speaks of the universal connection we all have with the land. My subjects are people who feel very at home in the outdoors. I see someone who looks interesting and I introduce myself. Sometimes these people are fleeting acquaintances and other times they turn into friends who end up working with me over a period of time. The people do much more than just lend scale to the landscape. The person and the environment have equal weight in terms of importance in the shared space of the picture frame. This is why it is so important to me to find just the right person who can work with my ideas and bring their own strong presence into the collaboration. Many of my models are creative people themselves, artists, writers, and musicians. They speak eloquently about the creative process of making art. Their comments, which follow, provide insight into what was going on behind the scenes and between the frames. Modeling for Ed is extreme, in the same way that hiking in the Tetons or ski racing is extreme. Photographer and model are often dealing with conditions and weather that can change unexpectedly. We sometimes hike for hours to arrive at a specific location. We traverse icy mountain streams that make our feet numb and take cover next to cliffs as nickel-sized pieces of hail fall from ominous yellowstone clouds. We try to be acutely aware of natural shapes, textures, and lines and mimic them with the body. The process is one of blending natural forms, the human, with the geologic or botanic. It draws on nature, on classical art, and portraiture for inspiration. His approach definitely inspired my thinking about form, posture, and composition. He showed me his photos and drawings of the lines and shapes made possible with limbs. Importantly, he always made me a participant in the entire process, asking me to be creative with my posturing and expression. Ed typically started our days at specific, special, hidden places that he'd found in his many years of exploration. I grew
grew up in Victor, Idaho, but was unaware of many of these places and features. For this photograph, I entered the deep spring pool, braced my arms against the banks, and submerged myself in the deep, cold water. I consciously relaxed, expressing a peaceful face as Ed clicked the shutter. When I couldn't hold back the shivers, I had to jump out and run around the grass to warm up. Modeling for Ed is thought-provoking, peaceful, and thrilling at the same time. The peacefulness of natural spaces, the thrill of natural forces, and the conscientious artistic production all contribute to the final image. You have to understand in the six months prior to posing for these pictures, I had driven up the spine of the Rocky Mountain Range, living on random communes, couch surfing with total strangers, and pitching my tent in pockets of wilderness all over the American West. This romantic existence wasn't normal for me. In my previous life, I had been your average, neurotic, civilized person. But it occurred to me that if I did not strike out soon, I'd miss out on taking part in the great American tradition of being young and reckless and going west. I rode a wave of phenomenal good luck northwest through the mountains, making friends and losing inhibitions along the way. By the time I reached the Tetons, I was tanner and wilder and freer than I'd been in my life, indiscriminately saying yes to whatever the universe threw my way. So, when Ed came up to me in a coffee shop to ask if he could photograph my raggedy old cowboy boots, I didn't think twice. My gut, which I was by then following religiously, told me to keep saying yes. Thank you, Ed. Our next presentation is uh, Whole, Food, Whole Food Rescue, self-titled. My name is Allie Dunford, and I started Whole Food Rescue. Allie's just another college grad who came out here because she loves mountains, but there's something more. This is not a glamorous slideshow, but it will tell a story. When I moved to Jackson a year ago, my roommates and I started jumping in local dumpsters to see what we could find. It turns out, lots of edible food was being thrown away. I started thinking about all the resources and human power that went into making the food, and then for it to just get thrown away seemed like a complete waste. Meanwhile, there were people in this community who were not getting adequate nutrition. The thing about food that's going to get thrown away is that it's the healthy food. It's stuff without preservatives and sodium, it's whole foods, it's fruits and veggies and things that provide nutrition. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, 1.3 billion tons of food is lost and wasted globally every year. The Natural Resources Defense Council says that getting food from a farm to a fork eats up 10% of the U.S. total energy budget, uses 50% of our land, and swallows 80% of all fresh water consumed in the United States. Yet, 40% of food from farm to fork is wasted. Thanks to the advice of the Community Foundation, I approached a local nonprofit to see if we could join forces to fight hunger. The Jackson Cupboard is focused on linking the collection and distribution of food to the needy, and that's what I wanted to do. The Cupboard embraced her idea, and Whole Food Rescue was born. Whole Food Rescue strives to create a more sensible food system. Our current objective is decreasing food waste and increasing the level of nutrition in at-risk, low-income populations of Jackson, Wyoming. We do this by relocating food waste to organizations committed to serving the community. 
After we were established, we started acquiring volunteers, bike trailers, contacts with the grocery stores and places we would bring the food. It was all happening. Biking is our preferred method of transportation, though it is not mandatory. We take pride in being human powered and urge our volunteers to consider biking first. Whole Food Rescue does pick up seven days a week from Albertsons, Jackson Hole Grocer, Persephone Bakery, and the local farmer's market. Thanks to the efforts of the grocery store employees, Whole Food Rescue is able to relocate thousands of pounds of food every week. These employees are the most essential part of Whole Food Rescue. They ensure the food is getting to our bins rather than the dumpster. After picking up the food from the grocery stores, we bike it to the Jackson Cupboard, the Latino Resource Center, Good Samaritan Mission, the Senior Center, and the Community Safety Network. The Jackson Cover, located in the campus of St. John's Church, is a food pantry open for qualified and needy residents four days a week. The Good Samaritan Mission on Pearl Street in Jackson provides shelter and prepared meals to about 40 people each day. My name is Becky Zays. I'm the executive director of the Senior Center. The impact for the seniors is fantastic. They come here for lunch because they can get one hot meal and then the other meal is a little sketchy. The produce is huge. By having the food here, they're able to eat a healthy meal later in the day as well. Any rescued food that rots before being delivered to people is fed as compost to animals at local farms. Beginning mid-June this past summer, Whole Food Rescue has saved 22,550 pounds of food from the dumpster. This equates to a meal equivalent of 18,791 meals. The group has 22 active volunteers. This is the product of one dedicated community. The community support for Whole Food Rescue is real. We helped the Jackson Cupboard raise over $30,000 at Old Bill's Fun Run, where we gave out free samples of food we had rescued. Although we've made huge strides with three months of work and relocated thousands of pounds of food, we're ready to take the next step forward. Whole Food Rescue is currently operating out of my garage. This isn't fair to my roommates, nor is it an ideal space to work with. A new facility could be a place to sort compost, store bikes, bins, and trailers, maintain our equipment, and train volunteers. In the future, this would allow us to accept unwanted food from more grocers and maybe even host seminars on preparing and preserving rescued food. Although the mountains are awesome, the thing I love most about Jackson Hole is the amazing community that lives here. Without their help, Whole Food Rescue would not be able to be what it is. Thank you, Jackson Hole, for making this possible. Our next uh, presentation is Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs, titled Jackson Hole's Opportunity for Global Leadership. Jackson Hole inspires all of us who live or visit here with its power of place. Buffalo, moose, trout, and bald eagle are just some of the wildlife that live in this valley. And we can see that we are part of an ecosystem. On the other side of the earth is a province in China called Shaanxi. 
The name Shanxi literally means west of the mountains. This region also has scenic beauty and broad vistas. For 5,000 years, Shanxi has been the cradle of Chinese civilization. A deep appreciation for the order of nature is reflected in their cultural heritage, as seen in this painting on the front of a Chinese temple. However, there is another side to this picture. Not all of us realize that Wyoming and Shaanxi province have been producing more coal than any other state or province in their country. Coal is the most carbon-intensive fossil fuel, and we use it for everything that we expect to sustain our lifestyle. 40% of the 1 billion tons of coal consumed each year in the U.S. comes from Wyoming. 25% of the 3 billion tons of coal consumed each year in China comes from Shaanxi province. The combined carbon emissions from coal produced in Wyoming and Shaanxi account for 7% of total global carbon emissions from all sources. These carbon emissions go up into the atmosphere. But there is no way for them to escape. The earth has no chimney. People the world over are experiencing the effects of carbon emissions and are saying, stop. In Jackson Hole, where environment is so closely guarded, those who think beyond the valley are feeling the same thing. What are we doing to our planet and all the beautiful expressions of life? What could happen to our wildlife here in Jackson Hole? What could happen to us? Young people look at our sky, the oceans, or the creatures of this planet, and they wonder, where are we going? There is a growing call to join the larger global vision, to look beyond our local environment, to act globally, to care for our Earth. For us, that begins here in Jackson Hole, where some changes can already be observed. We have an opportunity and a responsibility to take a leadership role. And so, over the last 10 years, a group of leaders in Jackson have enlisted the impressive hospitality resources and mountain panoramas of our valley to convene a series of international meetings on cleaner energy. In exchange, three groups of community leaders from Jackson Hole have visited Shaanxi Province to explore prospects for Chinese tourism and see modern facilities such as this coal gasification plant outside of the capital city of Shaanxi Province. These meetings have shaped the response to challenges of carbon emissions from coal in Shaanxi Province. Big things are happening. Press coverage, policy incentives, international partnerships, and three memorandums of understanding setting forth action steps have laid the groundwork for this progress. Years in the future, when we look back, what will we see that we did not do? And what will our children be dealing with? If not here, no there. If not this world, then where? If not us, not them. Let's increase our understanding. 
we can mobilize the next generation to be involved. And Jackson Hole, let's take action on the big stage. If not us, not them. If not now, then when? If not here, nor there. Forest fires already signal change in Wyoming, but Jackson Hole can bring leaders together to bear down on this challenge. Next we have the Mongolian Wolverine Project, titled Wolverines Without Borders, Thinking Big About Con uh, Conservation and Climate Change. This is a wolverine, one of the least known, most difficult to study carnivores on the planet. The largest terrestrial member of the weasel family, wolverines are imminently threatened by climate change. They're creatures of the snow and cold. They're physiologically adapted to frigid conditions, and females require deep spring snow in order to den. In the lower 48, they're found only in the mountains of the west, and the best places to see them are probably Glacier and Grand Teton National Parks. I moved to Jackson in 2008, partially because of an encounter that I had with the wolverine here. I was intrigued by this species because I identified with it. Small, happily solitary, a bit fierce, a lover of the snow and cold and mountains. Wolverines are also constantly on the move. They disperse over long distances and defend huge territories. The Tetons, fully occupied, hold about four adult wolverines. An adult male wolverine may defend a territory of up to 500 square miles, a female up to 200. As it happens, I too have a very large area in which I habitually roam. I spent my formative professional years working on wildlife conservation and environmental education in Mongolia, and I remained involved with conservation work there. Turns out, Mongolia had an unstudied population of wolverines. When I found out about it, it seemed like there was an irresistible synergy at work. When I moved out here, I volunteered with the Absorca Beartooth Wolverine Project. The project was run in association with Jackson's Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative, where I also worked as project manager on programs to resolve grizzly and wolf conflicts. But I had a secret agenda, to gain the skills necessary to conduct the world's first research project on wolverines in Mongolia. The Jackson community has been essential to this endeavor. Local wolverine biologist Jason Wilmot has been my mentor and the scientific advisor to the project and has traveled to Mongolia with me twice Mountain guide and wilderness advocate Forrest McCarthy spearheaded a ski expedition to Mongolia to track wolverines, and the Tetons were my training ground for honing my skiing and tracking skills. Jackson is also one of the few places where you can say, I want to go do a research project on Mongolian wolverines, and people are excited for you rather than worried about your sanity. Everyone around here has a big dream. Everyone has traveled internationally. Everyone gets being obsessed with wildlife. It's pretty energizing. But aside from self-gratification, what's the point of working on Mongolian wolverines? The challenge for this species, as the climate warms and snowpack diminishes, will be protecting it at the southern edge of its range globally. In the US, that's the Rockies. In the Eastern Hemisphere, it's Mongolia. We think that wolverines were wiped out as Rockies during the anti-wolf campaigns of the 19th century. Wolverines are scavengers and efficient at finding meat, including poison bait. They also reproduce very slowly, an average of one kit per female per year. And females don't start having babies until they're three or four. They only live for about a decade. Remember, wolverines have huge territories. So limited habitat plus big territories plus slow reproductive rate means a very slow population growth rate. Wolverines are still recolonizing the Rockies. And when we study them here, we aren't necessarily seeing the dynamics of a fully saturated landscape, which makes it challenging to come up with conservation options. 
Mongolians, on the other hand, have a pretty strong traditional conservation ethic. Wildlife is not only admired, it's imbued with supernatural powers. The idea of wiping out a species is offensive there. So wolverines were never extirpated from Mongolia. The population there is fully functioning. Maybe we can learn something about how to conserve them here from doing comparative work in both ecosystems. One example. This spring, Jason Wilmot, Forrest McCarthy, and I embarked with two other expedition members on a month-long ski trip through northern Mongolia. For several years, local Mongolian herders had been telling me that wolverines were, quote, abundant in the area. We were trying to ascertain what abundant meant, and the best way to do this was to go while snow was on the ground and see what we could find in the way of tracks. Wolverines are never really abundant. So we set off, predicting that in a month of skiing over a route that covered 250 miles through some of the most remote mountains in Mongolia, we might find one or two sets of tracks. It was a proverbial needle in a haystack kind of quest. You don't just go out looking for wolverines and expect to find them. 45 minutes after we set out on our first day in the field, we found our first set of tracks. By the end of 23 days in the field, we'd recorded 28 sets of tracks. Every drainage we skied, we were crossing tracks, constantly. It was unprecedented. We wouldn't expect to see something like this in the States. What does it mean? We're still trying to figure that out, but it is definitely intriguing. Wolverines force us to think about conservation at a huge scale. You can't protect wolverines in the Tetons without protecting wolverines throughout the West. They're part of a metapopulation, a series of connected population nodes that can't survive in isolation. They transcend the old divide between state and federal management because a single state can't preserve its wolverine population alone. But the scale is even bigger than that. In the face of climate change, wolverines are the ultimate umbrella species. They push us to understand that our amazing local ecosystem is actually global and that the wolverine could help protect us all. Mongolian herders, Jackson skiers, American ranchers, the towns and cities of the West all depend economically and ecologically on the same things that wolverines depend on. We need the snow for our recreation and for water for livestock and towns alike. We need the mountains for our own renewal and for the iconic wildlife and views that drive summer tourism. Wolverines need the snow and the cold for simple things, to den and raise their kits and to help preserve scavenged meat. But what befalls the wolverine befalls mountain communities all over the world. And it befalls all of us. There are a lot of deep divides around conservation, especially carnivore conservation in this ecosystem. The wolverine is non-controversial. It threatens no one, and its persistence on this landscape serves as a reminder that we all have common ground, regardless of where we fall on the political spectrum. We're all trying to protect our livelihoods and our values, and they're all tied to the mountains. Maybe I'm naive to attribute such unifying powers to a disreputable little mammal. But wolverines are renowned for refusing to back down. They'll stare down a bear, they hunt moose and reindeer, and they cross hundreds of miles to find new territories. If a 30-pound weasel can pull this stuff off, we should probably be capable of getting over our identity issues to come up with a sustainable energy policy that allows us all to prosper. Wolverines are up for potential listing under the Endangered Species Act. They're one of the species that makes the Tetons truly extraordinary, and they deserve protection. They embody the spirit of this place, and they link it to similar landscapes as far away as Mongolia. I'll continue to be inspired by the species, to hope for new ways to think big about conservation, and to travel my own route between these two landscapes that I love. Our next presentation is from the Jackson Hole High School Mountaineering Club, titled Grand Teton 2013. We went up the Grand Teton with the Jackson Hole Climbing Club in early September. It was pretty sweet because we got to miss two days of school. Uh, but basically, the first day we went up, it was pretty foggy and couldn't see the valley until we got about to Petzl Springs and then clouds started to break up. And it was a pretty fun time because it was really sunny and nice when we got to the lower saddle, and then we camped out in, in the little eggs and putt. And then, basically, the next morning, it got a little colder, uh, but it was still really sweet, and a couple people didn't make it, but for the most part, everybody, or most of the people who went up made it up, which is pretty sweet. And, basically, uh, it got really cold at about four in the morning, and I know one group on the day I went, which was on Tuesday, 
went up and they bailed off the upper exome into the sergeant's, pit, uh, the sergeant's pitch on the OS and where it was a little colder but not as windy and basically we all got to the top and it was really cloudy and you couldn't really see anything and so you just kind of hung out at the top for a little while, talked about some cool stuff and then went back down and just had a really fun time. It was pretty sweet. And my name is Anthony Menelisino. Oh, I'm Quinn. Um, I went up on the Grand on a Sunday Monday trip with the uh, Jackson High School Millenarian Club. It was pretty cool. Um, first day we hiked up to the top of the saddle, lower saddle and it looked a lot farther than it, it was a lot farther than it looked. Um, it was pretty cool. When we got up there, it was pretty windy, and that night there was a really big storm and really high winds. It was probably 10 degrees out, and there was like a blizzard for 10 minutes. So that was really, um, really good experience. Everybody had to sleep inside the hut, so it was pretty cramped. And then the next day, um, on that one stall dinger out, it was really icy, and it was kind of sketchy in some places when you were climbing up, like you would slip a little bit and. Um, you'd get caught, but you'd, you'd kind of be freaked out a little bit. So that was a, um, a good a good awakening when you slipped and when you got when we got to the top and everybody was up there, it was really, really great. You, you couldn't see very far because of all the clouds, but still it was an awesome experience. Hi, my name is Baruch Morales Martinez and I did the Grand this past fall and it was an awesome experience. We got to see new place. I forgot to see the whole valley from up there and uh, it's really fun. Climbing Club is all about basically trying to do your hardest and basically learning new things, learning, seeing new places and meeting new people. And Climbing Club is a fun activity to do because it will challenge you to be better and to do better. You can do to be successful and it's just really incredible and I think that the Climbing Club should be around for a while. Hi, my name is Stephanie Hart. Since I came into high school, um, I've gotten the experience to be able to be in climbing club, and I love to climb the mountains because it's just it's such a great experience, and it's something that nature should be built in every kid's life. Um, climbing club has given me a great opportunity to climb with people my age, which I think is so valuable because we all experience the joy of reaching the summit or of climbing and improving like all together in a big group. Hi, my name is Steve Shea, and I climbed the Grand Teton with the Jackson Hole High School Mountaineering Club. And it was a really cool experience for me because it rooted myself in the place where I grew up in Grand Teton National Park. And it was just fun to do some of the rocks that my dad did and just stand at the top of the world virtually. Hi, my name is Sydney Larson. I climbed the Grand with JHHS Mountaineering Club and I thought it was really fun because getting to the top of the Grand was amazing and the view was amazing and I'm really glad that I did it. My name is Mr. Dayton. I'm a science teacher at Jacksonville High School and an excellent mountain guide. I climbed the Grand because it is sweet, awesome, cool, gnarly, sick. <laughs> These are the words that our students use to describe their experiences in the mountains. However, when you listen carefully beyond the words and you see the smile on their faces, it is so clear that these experiences are much more than a singular event in their lives. They are the defining events where they push themselves beyond where they thought they could, where they experience our amazing mountains and the wilderness near our home, where they work together and they learn about themselves. They overcome challenges and they succeed beyond their wildest dreams. At the Jackson Hole High School, we have a class called Career and College Readiness where one of our emphasis is a social-emotional curriculum because research shows that students that are exposed to these lessons of social-emotional learning are more successful not only in high school, but in college and their life beyond. These lessons are challenging in the classroom, but these lessons are so, so important. And in the mountains, in the wilderness, in the Tetons, what we call home, there are lessons where the wilderness and the students themselves are better teachers than I could ever be. I'm involved in the Jackson Hole High School Climbing Club because of the growth the students experience. 
I have the pleasure of watching them succeed where they thought they could not, grow in ways they never thought possible, reach their fullest potential. These are the voices of the Jackson Hole High School Climbing Club. Without the support of the entire Jackson Hole community, this would not be possible. We would like to thank the Jackson Hole High School, the Teton County School District, Exum Mountain Guides, and most importantly, I would like to thank the students themselves. Thank, thank you, Jackson, Jackson Hole. I said that was pretty sweet. Next presentation we have is the Teton Raptor Center titled Taking Flight in Jackson Hole. Hi, my name is Zoe. I was first drawn to this valley because of its solitude, its outdoor opportunities, and its conservation-minded community. Teton Raptor Center is one group in particular that caught my eye soon after I arrived. This is the story of how they help raptor conservation take flight in Jackson Hole. I started volunteering with the Raptor Center, hoping to learn more about birds of prey. And after my first day, I was hooked. I volunteered weekly, each experience proving to be more enriching than the last. Now, one year later, I am interning at Teton Raptor Center, immersed in the work of this nonprofit organization. Teton Raptor Center has been a part of Jackson Hole for over two decades. Beginning in the early 90s, wildlife biologists Roger Smith and Margaret Creel began providing care to injured, ill, and orphaned raptors in their home. Today, the center continues their mission by helping birds of prey through education, conservation, and rehabilitation. In 2013 alone, more than 25,000 people participated in Teton Raptor Center's educational programs. Through on-site tours, classroom visits, national park presentations, and community events, we enable visitors to have a truly unique experience, including up-close encounters with feathered friends like this Eurasian eagle owl. Our programs give visitors the opportunity to watch these aerial acrobats in action. Here, a Harris hawk prepares to catch a treat in mid-air. One of the only raptors to hunt collectively, Harris hawks are highly social. This guy loves showing off for visitors. It's not all hard work for our raptors, though. These inquisitive, playful birds get plenty of enrichment and time off. When not flying high above the valley, providing us with a bird's eye view through the falcon cam, this Jir Peregrine hybrid likes to spend his free time clowning around. While education is a huge component of what we do, we recognize that conservation requires action as well. At Teton Raptor Center, we have a number of projects ranging from backyard initiatives to scientific research that contribute to raptor conservation on the local, national, and international levels. The Porta Potty Owl Project, affectionately called the Poo Poo Project, began with reports of tiny owls being found in the vault toilets on public lands. Seeking a place to roost, these little guys enter the toilet's ventilation pipe and become trapped in the muck below. Many, like this northern sawwood owl, succumb to infections even if rescued. To prevent these deaths, Teton Raptor Center created a custom cap to prevent entrapment. Thanks to a generous grant from 1% for the Tetons, Grand Teton National Park and Teton County, Wyoming became the first areas of the country to be completely capped. The Poo Poo Project now has spread to 12 states and is growing fast. Another project gaining momentum is our Osprey DNA Project. Despite being one of the most beloved and visible birds in Jackson Hole, very little is known about the structure of osprey populations. Teton Raptor Center is now using DNA from molted feathers to map the relationships and habits of these amazing raptors throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Conservation doesn't have to be technical or expensive. Something as simple as a nest box can make a world of a difference to a species in peril, like this American kestrel. Through our kestrel cause, you can learn how to help the smallest falcon by creating a safe habitat right in your own backyard. But sometimes conservation just isn't enough. Cars, fences, windows, power lines, and pets all represent extra hazards for a raptor.
For those who find themselves in trouble, including this trio of great horned owls, T-Town Raptor Center provides round-the-clock medical care, 365 days per year. Take the extraordinary case of this female bald eagle. She was struck head-on by a truck going more than 60 miles per hour. Despite the tremendous impact, she survived with only minor injuries. After more than two months in our clinic, where her wounds healed and she regained her strength, she made a successful return to the wild. The patients in our clinic not only receive emergency treatment for their wounds and ailments, but they also receive physical therapy and conditioning, giving them the best chance of a complete recovery and release. Here a female osprey gets a flight lesson while recovering from a gunshot wound. It is a federal crime to shoot a wild raptor. Not all of our patients are injured. Some, like this orphaned baby red-tailed hawk, just needed a little time in TLC. After a few weeks, he grew into a fierce and healthy fledgling and was released into a foster nest. For every bird that comes through our doors, the ultimate goal is a successful return to the wild. Teton Raptor Center has treated more than 220 birds since 2010, with over 40% of our patients being released, a success rate that is well above the national average. None of this work, education, conservation, or rehabilitation would be possible without the support of our community and our volunteers. Nearly 2,000 hours of time and talent were donated to the center in the last year by volunteers who help with everything from rescues and programs to yard work and event planning. So how can you help? Visit our website at www.tetonraptorcenter.org to learn more about Teton Raptor Center and Birds of Prey. Learn what to do if you spot an injured, ill, or orphaned raptor. Consider simple solutions to make your yard a safer place for wildlife. Teton Raptor Center would like to offer our sincere thanks to the individuals who contributed to the photos you've just seen. Rebecca Breedhoft, Alan Lank, Alex May, Ben Wright, Diane DeBold, Ian Dolly, Megan Warren, Mike Voss, Mr. T in DC, Steve and Barbara Huff, Tambaco, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. The poet Gary Snyder once said, Nature is not a place to visit, it is home. Nowhere is... Okay, so we're gonna have a 25, 30 minute intermission here. So, uh, you know, there's gonna be a People's Choice Award at the end, so you guys are going to be voting on these films that you have seen here, so keep that in mind. And uh, yeah, we'll see you back here in a little bit.